link here than I had. I, I just came through Shea of Palamine that sells burgers at football matches <laughs> <laughs> and he dragged me out one day and said look will you come up to Coomamine and, and meet a few people and have a chat with some of the lads yeah. and I did <laughs> and here I'm still going five or six years later coming <laughs> up and uh, hearing fabulous stories and stories of hope and renewal and yeah. uh, people getting their lives back together and, yeah stories of the extraordinary staff. You probably have a, you have a, you have a, you have a closer link, I think, have you? It's a very, uh, just a very inspired in place, uh, Brian, isn't it? It's just, it's very, uh, it gives me a lift here every time I come out here. It's just a great vibration here, isn't it? And uh, I, I came here first, a friend of mine, Owen Coughlin from Cork. He's a great uh, musician, but he worked with Kill Moyen here. And uh, he just said, come up, if a few of the lads are into our music and they'll come up and sing them a song. So David, uh, what was your life like before you came to Kilmoyne? My life before Kilmoyne was very chaotic. It was a young fella just on a path of destruction that I just couldn't get away from. But I grew up with a load of lads in Blanchestown and I crossed an invisible line somewhere that they all started getting trades and growing up and getting married yeah. and I ended up on a path to prison, harmlessness, and just out of control. Sure, sure. In Talek, growing up yeah. in the 80s, there was a lot of joyriding going on, there was a lot of criminality. Yeah. And uh, be, being introduced to solvent abuse, sniffing glue and tipex sinners at, at a young age, kind of developed into smoking cannabis, mm. um, getting involved then at the age of 15, 16, into the kind of, take them up as known as DF 118s, which was codeine based, DFC. and, and kind of, I'll say falling in love with them yeah. because that's what really happens, you know. I mean, yeah. everything goes out the window at that stage in your life, even at 15 or 16. Mm. Heroin and morphine kind of came into, into the scene then. I was about 17 at the time. Mm. Um, had picked up a couple of charges, started getting involved in drug use. The kind of weekend drug scene had gone and it took, took me over at the age of 17 or 18. It's hard on a parent, you know, and I suppose I'm, I'm to give the parents' point of view. It's hard on a parent because, one, you don't know anything. You have to go on Google and find out what's heroin, what do you do about it, how does it work, how do you fight it. Um, it's a bit shameful, you know, you feel, because, you know, the way people say, well, I blame the parents. Well, the parents blame the parents too. The parents blame themselves. You say, right, I should have, you know, I should have got our them runners that she wanted instead of getting the cheap ones. She must have got slagged in school. She's just, she you know. Stuff in her head yeah, out. yeah, yeah, your head is wrecked. And at the same time, you're kind of, you know, a day life. Mm. Uh, this is another day, they got through another day. But your fear is, your fear is always that you're going to lose them. So I worked in the, the building sites and all everyday life was just about going to work and living for the weekend to get that drink, you know? Yeah. Um, I ended up getting a girl pregnant and wasn't very good to her, you know. Mm. And I ended up uh, destroying that relationship with my daughter, yeah. you know. I um, wasn't really there for her. And um, yeah, just consequences, but no matter what the consequences were, I, never, I could never stop, you know. Sure. Sure. But by the end of it now, I 
it started off with the drink and all, but by the end of it, it was it was cracking heroin and living in a homeless hostel in town. You know, true. Sure. Um, that's that's pretty much what my life was like beforehand. You know, I always ended up building up a bit of self-esteem, building up a bit of a life, and then just get gets destroyed again. Sure. You know, so life yeah. before kill mine, it was unmanageable. Yeah. I would say that. Yeah. I come from a family of, of extreme dysfunction and my mother was a chronic alcoholic so I grew up with a lot of trauma you know so I would have blamed my mother a lot for my own addiction so at about the age of eight my mother would have got me drunk drinking homebrew and that was my first experience with, with drugs or alcohol and then that went on to um, I suppose 12, 13 was the weed and the alcohol really and then after that and I was trying to fit in because um, there, there was needs in me that hadn't been met as a child okay. and I was reaching out trying to get them. I was, I was an IV heroin user, I was on crack, I was on methadone, I was on the bends, I was on, on anything at the time that I could get my hands on just to, to, to not feel basically. And m my mental health, like I had that many failed suicide attempts, I was like, I, I couldn't. I couldn't be a successful drug addict, and I couldn't even take my own life. I couldn't do anything. Nothing I put my hands to worked back then. I used to cry out to God, like answer, answer me prayers and help me, and nothing ever happened. Lord, won't you give me this What was it like when you when you when you when you came to Cool Mine? Um, it was very hard, man. I'd say so. I'd I didn't so. want I didn't want to be here, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But I didn't want to be in the hostels either. Mm. Um, I always had that problem growing up. If I was if I was at A, I wanted to be in B, and if I was at B, I wanted to be at A. I was mm. never happy no matter where I was in my head, you know. Yeah. What was it say? Especially about Cool Mine. How how it's ran by the clients. It's really self-run. Um, I know the staff, they sit in and facilitate the groups, but the, the, the thing about the therapeutic community, it's community as method. Every, everyone's working together mm. to achieve the same thing. You know, you get a role, you either work outside in the environment or mm. you get a job in the kitchen or the, the maintenance department or the horticulture we have around the back. We grow veg and tomatoes and things like that. And um, yeah, it's it's special in, the, in a sense that they just bring you in and talk to you and go, come on in, like, oh, come here, sit down, have something to eat. What's mm. wrong with you? I never had that in my life. Sure. I never had that. Coal Mine has a real focus on the peer supporting each other, but giving them the tools to be able to do that. So that's where, because people might say, well, what do the staff do? <laughs> you know, why do you have staff? So the staff have to be able to provide the tools for people to be able to do that. So when we talk about what tools are they, we do a lot of workshops here in Comine. So a lot of the workshops might be challenging negative thinking. Showing a person how to challenge when they start thinking negatively. Relapse prevention, communication skills, problem solving skills. So these are all the tools that the pair will require to help support each other. But ultimately, they are the people they leave with. And that's what, that's what I love about Comine. I had my 24th birthday party here right. and it was the best party I ever had in my life. Was it? It was unbelievable. And I just felt at the time, I said, this is a bit special, this place. You can feel people really care about you. Yeah. In 1990s here, I graduated and I was asked to come back and work as a full-time staff member for two years. Right. So that was great. But I have to say, I Did think... you start saving people then? Well, I try not to say that. I think your music saves people be better than me saving people. Like, I try not to fall into that trap. I try, try and support people. Sure, sure. And I don't even give people advice. I try and support them through my own experience. When I came into Cool Mine, you know, the, the biggest thing that stands out to me was how safe I felt. Because I'd come from a life of living on the streets. I'd come from a life of 
people coming into my house that shouldn't have been in the house. Like, I don't want to say too much because uh, um, it's family and friends are listening and, and, and I don't want to have, have, have an impact on their own emotions. And I learned how to laugh. You know, I'd been, I was so disconnected from my emotions when I learned, came into Kilma and I couldn't even cry. On a, a journey with my key worker at the time, she was able to help me to to understand, to regulate, and then... And to it, express, and to express yeah. those emotions. And to communicate. Like, communicate, communicate is one so, of the so big... So here you are safe, and you're among people that you could communicate yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. But what happened when I graduated was, I was over a year sober, and things were going well, and I was at the start back up a little college course, I was doing a bit of work with the radio across the way. Yeah. Life was good, <clears throat> and I lost track again. I remember having a conversation with myself saying, Oh, Grant, like, look at you flying. This is my own head talking to me. You're flying. Look at you. They don't need you. Well, you don't need to do any of them meetings or anything. Uh, yeah. you, had, you grew up with the wrong crowd, but look at you now. You're flying. But very, very quickly after having that conversation, probably within two weeks, I was back in the shit again. Paul Hatton kept putting his hand out, mm. kept getting me back in. You know, I'd come to that gate in an awful mess. I'd have no family around me. There'd be no one could be near me because it was a tornado. I couldn't. Just couldn't be managed. But Paul kept putting his hand out. Paul seeing something that I couldn't even see in myself that no one else could see. Yeah. I didn't even know where I was going or what was happening in life. I say, listen, come in, stay. Will you stay? Yeah, of course. I said, there's no way to go. I don't know where to be even going. And that happened a number of times where like I just felt my bridges are born, but I'd still ring him. I always had Paul's number if you wanted to ring him. Yeah. Paul needs your help him. And he'd done it repeatedly, repeatedly. And then just a penny dropped. And he just dropped. And finally, my life just started to change. Listen to me. Kilmoyan is just, will, he, believe, will help you when no one else will help you. Sure. You know, when you've no one in your life, you're in the gutter, you've no one. Mm. No one believes, you don't even believe in yourself, you don't even see worthiness in yourself, you're so low. Sure. Kilmoyan see you, the people, the staff in Kilmoyan see in you what you don't see in yourself and what nobody else, they believe in you. Yeah. They believe that there's something in there that you don't believe is in there. Yeah. And they, they unlock a potential. Yeah. They unlock a potential out of people that's hidden away yeah. for so long. Yeah. You know, they get people back into society, education, jobs. Just, they just bring a, a light out in people. Yeah. That's, I don't know how they do it, but they do it. I'll try a song about, uh, this is about, you know, uh, Trying to let go of things in your past that are affecting you, that are stopping you from living a good life today and doing good things, you know? Trying to let the stuff go from your, from your past, you know? Selfish, lonely, 
don't you know? If you truly seek forgiveness, you must find it within you. It will come with reparation and the good things you now do. When they're on drugs, you kind of lose the dreams you had for their future, the dreams you had for the life that you wanted them to have. And it wasn't, it was more about wanting them to be healthy and happy and, and to have an easier life and stuff like that. So it takes the difficulty in some respects out of their lives when they recover. Sure. That difficulty, that, that shame. And what does the recovery journey mean to you? It meant to me just reintegrating back into society, you know, just being a normal member, not a destructive member of society. Obviously it means not picking up a substance to deal with my emotions. Yeah. To be a father, to be a son again, to be a brother. It's, it's a sense of achievement at the end of the day if I've done something for someone else, you know. And I love, I, I'll never be able to repay Kilmine for what they've given me. Sure. But I, I'll try, you know, sure. I'll try my best. And what's that life like for you now? Um, well, let's move on. Well, it's probably <laughs> dead stone heavier. Uh, um, I, I set up a, a catering business the last 20 years. I, I feel that Kilmine gave me the confidence. I've always found I like to have an impact on people. Mm. And I feel in Kilmine, coming back to Kilmine, I have an impact on people's lives. Great. So it's just a privilege to be able to yeah. be in that position and trusted with that position. Sure. But I think the main thing is I have a life. Like, I, I should be dead. Um, I have a good life. I have a life with ups and downs in it. I, I have to pay bills. I have to deal with family. I have to deal with trauma. Um, I have to deal with my own triggers, which I said the last time I had done an interview. Like, that doesn't stop. Life is still there. Bills have to be paid. I'm in education at the moment. I'm in uh, DCU doing a course. Doing? I'm what, doing what, what course homeless intervention and prevention. Lovely. So that's brilliant. Lovely. It's, it's, it's just great to be walking in and being a student and part of that yeah. normal life that I didn't get when I was, was a child. Um, I'm in full-time employment. I'm with the same organisation for the last eight years, working with homeless women. I love it. I have a lot of skills that I'm able to give them that I've learned through Cool Mine. I have the language because I went through Cool Mine. Um, I've travelled. I've done missionary work and travelled and worked in orphanages. It has what you find is needed, the, the beginning, the middle, and the continuous end, you know, so the ongoing life support. You see your child become healthy, yeah. put a bit of weight back on, get a little bit of a shine in their eyes. My recovery has recovered my family, my grandparents, my parents, my brothers, my nephews, my nieces, my partner, my children. <clears throat> this has had such effect on Everybody, like I brought, I, I dragged the bill, I probably dragged a hundred people down with me, like literally, misery, but brought them all back up with me. Like my ma last night, I only talked to my ma last night, she couldn't be prouder of where I am. 
and she's delighted, but it brought a sense of ease and comfort to her, yeah. you know, which gives me ease and comfort, yeah. you know, so she sees what I'm doing. My uncle only said to me last week, he said, if you had just like got your life together and he said, just stayed on social welfare or whatever, we'd have been all proud of you. He said, but you're fucking, you're after setting this, you're after just raising the bar. Like, well, we can't believe what you're after doing. So I love hearing that. It's great. Do you know? So yeah, it is great. Long, long may it last. Well done, bro. Much yeah, more thanks respect. Thanks very much. Thanks, definitely. Yeah. And the Owl's Triangle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.